It's time now for questions to the Minister of Justice. And could I at the outset inform members that questions 5 and 10 have been withdrawn. And I call Mr Robin Swan. Question number 1, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As I set out in my ministerial statement on the 8th of February, access to justice is not simply a matter of physical proximity or about having courthouses in every town. In this context, it is about ensuring that court users are treated fairly and have access to appropriate services when they are needed. The closure of six courthouses will not see a reduction in scheduled court sittings as business will transfer on a like-for-like -like basis to the new venues. Therefore, there is no reason that there would be any negative impact on access to court time. The remaining courthouses in the estate will ensure that access to justice within a reasonable travelling distance is preserved for court users. I welcome the indication of the Lord Chief Justice that the judiciary is prepared to consider the timings for court proceedings and explore the benefits of a more flexible court sitting day to alleviate any difficulties individual users may have. NICS has invested significantly in improvements to operating models and to services it provides to court users, particularly its IT infrastructure and the ability to support video links in all major courthouses. The retained venues are some of our more modern or larger courthouses, which offer advantages for vulnerable victims and witnesses, including better facilities for segregation. I thank the Minister for his answer. And his answer there used the phrase physical proximity. And in an earlier one, he actually made the statement he referred to me there would be no job losses. Could, would the Minister comment on the effect the closure of Balamina Courthouse will actually have on the town itself in regard to solicitors and law offices that are obviously based in the town because of the proximity to the court itself and the business that they create then to the shops and the coffee houses and the restaurants that are already situated in the town? Well, I thank Mr Swan for that supplementary. Certainly, a small number of jobs the direct court service employees will move from Balamina to Antrim. I would have thought, and living between Antrim and Balamina, I do have some knowledge of both of those towns, that there would be a significant number of solicitors' practices which, because they have a variety of different interests and are not solely concentrating on business in courts, will continue there because Balamina is a significant shopping and market centre. So I think uh, the likelihood of any significant number of jobs other than the small number of direct jobs in the courts and tribunal service moving is, I suspect, quite small. Again, call Mr. Alistair Ross. The amount of money has been put into Bellamina Courthouse in recent years to upgrade the facilities there. Rather than leaving the building at not fulfilling a function, would the Minister look favourably upon creating a community justice centre at Bellamina Courthouse or indeed in piling a drugs court? given the other facilities that are around the Ballymena town uh, and using uh, the courthouse as a, a pilot area for a drugs court in the future? Well, I appreciate the committee chair's question, Mr Speaker. He's indeed just written to me recently about the issue. Um, I think there are questions about exactly uh, whether it's possible to do alternative work beyond the work which is currently being provided for as to whether there's a displacement issue. But I have certainly asked officials to look at the suggestion he has made, though that is a promise to look at the suggestion. It's not a promise of delivering anything specific at this point. Thank you. And I call Mr Raymond McCartney. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker, and can I thank the, the Minister for his answers. Can I ask the Minister, one of the things that seems to lack a, a degree of clarity is the actual savings which will be made when these courthouses close. You know, some people are saying there's a saving, but then there will be, uh, the department will have some monies they pay towards what is called warm storage. Can the Minister perhaps for the future outline precisely the exact much which will be saved each year in each courthouse? Well, Mr Speaker, I don't have those figures with me at the minute. I have given them previously, and I can confirm that all the figures that I have been given have been net of the cost of continuing to maintain businesses until such point as they're disposed of. And call Mr Jim Mallister. Of course, if access to justice for the people in the area really mattered to the Minister, then he wouldn't be closing the wonderful expensively upgraded Balamina Courthouse. So for all the platitudes his actions speak towards, he couldn't care less about access for the people of Balamina to a courthouse. And he, even today when he's asked the question, how many jobs are going to be lost? He couldn't even put a figure on it. Would he at least put a figure on it, so as we know? 
Well, Mr. Speaker, along with the usual insults that we expect from Mr. Alistair, he is asking me to answer a question which simply cannot be answered. I don't control the location of solicitors' offices. Private businesses that locate where they wish. That was the point that, was the point that I was making very specifically to Mr. Swan. And uh, I don't know whether Mr. Alistair, with his extensive legal experience, can tell solicitors where they'll be locating in future, but I'm afraid I can't. Mr. Speaker, question two. Mr. Speaker, with permission, I will answer questions 2, 7 and 11 together. First and foremost, I believe this is a good news story. We changed the law in 2011 to keep the recovered criminal asset money in Northern Ireland. Since it was first launched in 2011, the Assets Recovery Community Scheme has awarded nearly £3.5 million to a variety of projects. This funding is money which has been taken out of the hands of criminals and returned to the community. It is clear to me from witnessing a number of projects firsthand that they make a real difference. ARCS is a popular scheme and perhaps influenced in part by the current economic environment is greatly oversubscribed. In the 2015-16 competition, 75 applications were received and available funding allowed awards to 23 groups. The recently launched 2016-17 competition has received around 150 applications. Assessment of these is currently underway. Applications are assessed individually against the criteria for the scheme. Although submitted via PCSPs, they are not considered geographically. Those meeting the criteria are then scored on areas including evidence of need, actions proposed and value for money. These scorings are then reviewed by a panel of senior officials before I reach a final decision. Details cannot be given about allocations in South Belfast as most projects would extend across the city. In the last four years, projects in the Belfast area have received in the region of £170,000. In the current round, there are 30 applicants from the Belfast area. And I call Mr. Adrian McQuillan. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for his answer there? Um, Minister, I don't know if these figures are worth or not, but could you break it down specifically on how many groups actually applied from East London area? And also, could you give us a flavour of the, the support that the groups got? Well, I'm afraid, Mr. Speaker, I didn't come up with the full detail, but I'll happily write uh, to Mr. McQuillan with the details for his constituency. Certainly, at the point when awards are made, uh, those full details will be published detailing all of those. But part of the issue, of course, is that we are not sure from month to month how much will actually be received through the scheme. So there will be, in effect, a first list, and then there will be reserves if additional money becomes available. Thank you. And I call Mr. Fergal McKinney. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the Minister will be aware of the increase in burglaries in South Belfast in the recent past. And is there any consideration being given to monies being uh, directed towards either deterrence or awareness or uh, protecting those who have been uh, the victim of such burglaries? Well, I can certainly assure Mr. McKinney that the, the principal aim behind the scheme is to fight crime, the fear of crime and antisocial behaviour. So the issues which he has highlighted on a number of occasions relating to burglaries in his constituency will be issues which will clearly come well within the scheme. I do not at this stage have details of the 30 Belfast applications and what there might be, um, but those are currently being assessed. And if there are schemes which score highly enough in that respect, they will certainly be getting grant. Thank you. And I call Mr. David Hildage. Mr. Speaker, I should, probably should declare a non pecuniary interest as an official of a, a, a midnight soccer scheme, which actually feels of some of the money. Uh, I would acknowledge the work of the scheme and, and congratulate its implementation, and, because I've seen that work at first hand for the benefit of the young people who have participated. Can the Minister give a commitment to its future in, in terms of uh, length of time or, or how it could be enhanced going forward? Well, I can certainly give a commitment, Mr. Speaker, as long as I am Minister, that the scheme will continue um, and that arrangements are going ahead for the scheme to run in 2016-17. But we should be very clear, this was money which we only got after devolution. Prior to devolution, the half of the money which goes to the agencies responsible came back to the agencies within Northern Ireland, but the half which we distribute in community graphs uh, was simply not available uh, in Northern Ireland. So that is in itself good news. Three and a half million pounds in community grants that would not have happened otherwise. And I can't imagine uh, that there are any prospects in which this scheme would not continue. The difficulty is that we have to spend the money in the year we receive it, and it's not as flexible as one would hope it might be. Thank you. And I call Mr. Sean Lynch. 
to Can call you, and I want to thank the Minister for his answer this far and welcome the scheme. One of the objectives of the scheme from the outset, the uh, Minister, was the prevention of crime and the reduction of fear of crime. Can the Minister give an outline of how that has been achieved to date? Grimaugut. Well, I could probably stand up here all afternoon, Mr Speaker, and you'd cut me off at two minutes if I gave some of the examples. But, I mean, for example, Mr Hilditch has just highlighted the Midnight Soccer Scheme, which is run in a number of areas, deterring young people from getting engaged in antisocial behaviour. Um, I have seen schemes uh, which were directly aimed at providing uh, crime-fighting materials, you know, door chains, spy glasses and so on, to older and vulnerable people. So there are a variety of issues in which confidence can be provided and in which crime can be fought, both in the sense of the deterrence and in terms of direct issues uh, of whatever resources are needed to make it more difficult for crimes to be committed. But it really is a matter of a variety of imaginative ideas coming in from community groups through PCSPs right across Northern Ireland, and I think it's been very positive in that respect. Thank you, and I call Mr Oliver McMullen. Can I ask the Minister? Can he outline the number of groups who work with people who have disabilities and special needs who have been successful in applying to the uh, Assets Recovery Community Scheme? Well, I'm afraid, Mr Speaker, no, I can't give that level of detail at question time. But if there's a specific question around that, because groups which work with people with special needs is a fairly wide, uh, wide category, I have no doubt that some of them are included within a general categorisation. But perhaps if, McMullen, if Mr McMullen has a specific question, if he wants to write to me, I'll certainly answer it. And I call Mr. Roy Biggs. Question number three. The role played by the media in reporting cases and their outcomes is an essential component of the principle of open justice. Access to court by the media and by the public is not affected by a reduction in the number of courthouses. In this digital age, it is possible for reporters to submit articles directly from courthouses or to avail of other technologies such as Skype. Wi-Fi access in courts outside Belfast has also been factored into the Court Service Future ICT modernisation programme. Nix provides a specific online service for the media, allowing them to access full case details seven days in advance of the hearing. This, in addition to the services of press teams in Nix and the Office of the Lord Chief Justice, has reduced the need for reporters to attend court for every single hearing, which clearly frees up staff time. Thank you. And I'll call Mr Beggs for supplementary. As well as reporting um, decisions of court, I think it's important that the public is aware of, of the cases themselves. And with the centralisation of courts, there will of course be no courtroom within the Mid and East Antrim Council area, and making it more difficult for local journalists to report. Would the Minister accept that um, whilst the, the reports may be online, it will be more difficult for local journalists and local people to actually access that information if it's not near to them? And has there been, been consideration given to, just like the Assembly Committees or local councils, to put courts online where the public will be able to follow what is said in a courtroom? Well, I think Mr Begg's latter point, though it's interesting, Mr Speaker, takes us into a very different area, which is around the whole issue of uh, putting courts online and you'll know that that is something which has only been done in a very limited way in Scotland or in the Supreme Court when giving decisions. So I think we're a long way from seeing the benefits of that. I must say, um, living not that far and in the adjacent council uh, to Mr Beggs, I don't see any difficulty in my local newspapers reporting the activities of either Mid and East Antrim or Antrim and Newton Abbey councils where reporters have to travel a bit. And I can't therefore see that they would have much problem in reporting courts either. I call Mr Paul Given. Speaker, um, given the success of the uh, introduction of televising some of the court proceedings uh, in the mainland, is this not something that he could encourage the Lord Chief Justice to facilitate, at least with the Court of Appeal in Northern Ireland, so that the public are able to see exactly what is happening in the courts, rather than having a filter of journalists having to do it from outside the building or indeed in the print media? And this would be a good way to open up the courts to greater access. Well, I certainly think Mr Given raises an interesting point when we talk about things like the Court of Appeal giving judgments. However, I'm not sure, given the length of time a judgment can take in the Court of Appeal, uh, that we'd necessarily have the public seeing everything. We might well have the public having something filtered through television editors rather than television reporters selectively reporting from the street outside. It's certainly an issue which merits consideration, but I must confess it's not my first priority in terms of management of the courts at this stage. 
to Kieran McCarthy. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his, his answer so far and his acknowledgement that reporting in court cases are very important and perhaps maybe even a deterrent for further crime. But can the Minister advise the House whether any media or press organisations responded to the consultation on the court rationalisation? Uh, the answer to Mr McCarthy's question is fairly simple, Mr Speaker. No uh, media organisation uh, made any response to the consultation around court closures. I think um, one, uh, one raised it uh, at the issue of the potential closure of Inniskillen um, in the sense of uh, a local newspaper representative talking about travelling time for journalists. But, of course, members will recall that Inniskillen is remaining as a hearing centre so that particular problem has been addressed, but there were certainly no formal responses from any media organisation. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Mr Alban McGuinness. Mr Speaker, uh, question number four. With permission, Mr Speaker, I will take questions four and nine together. Both of these questions go to the heart of what prison is for. I have often said that people are sent to prison as punishment and not for punishment. Recognising that the vast majority of prisoners will return to our community, we have done much in recent years to ensure that we use the time that people spend in prison to address the types of behaviour that put them in prison, to rehabilitate them and prepare them for return to society. In September of last year, I published Supporting Change, a Strategic Approach to Desistance, setting up my department's commitment to providing a flexible, person-centred approach which reduces reoffending. The prison service contributes to this strategy by making rehabilitation central to how prisons operate, providing opportunities for people to change and make a positive contribution to their families and to wider society. The prisoner development model supports, challenges and motivates people throughout their time in prison. Individual risks, needs and strengths are identified so that a structured, tailored personal development plan is agreed with a prisoner to assist them as they prepare for release. When appropriate, people in custody may also participate in programmes to address the distorted thinking and attitudes which have led to their offending behaviour, thereby reducing the likelihood of future offending. Belfast Metropolitan College and North West Regional College provide a wide curriculum of learning and skills across prison establishments, all of which will result in an accredited outcome. The prison service also works in partnership with employers to provide work experience and job sampling opportunities for prisoners prior to their release. In all of these ways, we have put rehabilitation and transformational change at the heart of the prison service in Northern Ireland. That remains the direction of our prison service, and the Prime Minister's recent statement suggests that England and Wales are now following on the same path. And I call Ms. Sam oh, sorry, Mr. Alban McGuinness for a supplementary. I beg your pardon. Not at all, uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Um, I thank the Minister for his answers. Certainly, progress has been made in relation to providing the means for rehabilitation for offenders, uh, but much more work needs to be done, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, would the Minister outline any plans he might have or any ideas he might have in terms of expanding uh, the area of um, employment that uh, ex-offenders might be able to avail of in order to provide a full integration back into the community? Well, I think uh, Mr McGuinness puts his finger on one of the key issues about rehabilitation, which is the opportunity for employment or other constructive worthwhile activity. We have certainly seen some significant improvements, particularly around Hyde Bank Wood, but we have also seen uh, very significant opportunities uh, for employment and voluntary service, in a sense, uh, based around McGilligan as well in recent time. I certainly think the fact that we have a number of enterprises based in our prisons and the number which are employing people in and as they leave and for a short period afterwards. For example, the Thinking Cup Cafe and the Book Reserve in South Belfast, which is working with young men who have family responsibilities, assisting them into getting into a culture of employment as they leave, is the right kind of example. I'm also very conscious of the fact that despite a significant increase in that work, there remain a number of prisoners who do not have those opportunities, either in learning and skills or in direct work. And it's an area where we need to continue to work with some of our voluntary sector partners outside as well to get the best possible opportunities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the Minister for uh, his response. And 
really also to commend the minister on his determination and, and his work on uh, reforming the uh, criminal pr uh, system, uh, focusing on rehab rehabilitation and uh, on, on reduction of reoffending. <laughs> Can I ask the minister, does he believe that the prison reform program has made significant changes uh, that will improve outcomes for uh, prisoners and the wider society? Well, yes, Mr. Speaker, I certainly do. We are, of course, conscious that this week we are due to see um, the latest update uh, on the criminal justice inspection of McGabry uh, Prison. But alongside some short-term difficulties which we have seen there, we have seen very significant issues, which, for example, saw the last meeting of the Prison uh, Review Oversight Group signing off on 36 of the 40 recommendations made by the Prison Review Team, 90 per cent, many of which are about embedding long-term structural change. It's very significant. But we've seen massive issues in terms of refresh and improved training for staff across a variety of, uh, of grades. High Bank College is the first secure college anywhere in the United Kingdom. We've seen the reopening of Barron House uh, as a step-down facility for men and the opening of uh, Murray House as a step-down facility for women. Um, a variety of plans subject to capital, obviously, if anybody wishes to speak to the finance minister, uh, to develop all three prisons. The very significant partnership with the two uh, colleges in terms of the provision of accredited courses on the same basis they would happen outside. The, the work I mentioned on the desistance strategy, the work rolling out the INSPIRE program for women, all of those show very significant advances in recent years, which I believe are now part of the culture of the prison service and which will make a real difference in the years ahead. Thank you. And I call Mr. Thomas Buchanan. Question number six, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the prison service continues to maintain a clear focus on the safety of staff. The McGabry senior management team has been refreshed and strengthened, and unit managers are now based in the residential areas to provide visible leadership and support for staff. Staff training and the rotation of staff working in the more stressful areas is ongoing. The introduction of a new core day for prisoners with more appropriate meal times and longer periods outside residential units reduces prisoner frustration and provides a safer environment for all. Other measures put in place in regard to safety are the visible patrolling of prisoner recreation areas by staff and the piloting of body warm cameras. The use of these cameras by staff has clearly led to a lessening in verbal abuse and a reduction in aggression directed at officers. The safety of staff and prisoners remains under constant review. I call Mr. Buchanan for supplementary. Thank you. Uh, thank the Minister for his response. Could the Minister advise how many officers are currently off work due to injury on duty? and what, um, what support services are offered to them? Well, I can't give the immediate stats for the numbers who are off work today for injury on duty, but certainly there are very solid arrangements in place to provide support for prisoners, um, including counselling service, including life, line managers keeping in touch and offering assistance in dealing with sickness issues, all of which is carried out in connection with the, the general processes outlined in the Civil Service Handbook, but recognising that prison officers are in a particularly uh, difficult place compared to many civil servants. And I do believe that that support has shown that numbers who are off on sick can be reduced, as has happened in recent months, and I believe that is good for all concerned. Thank the Minister for his answer today. Minister, have you any plans to meet or indeed have you met the Prison Officers Association on these issues? Uh, as I said, I think at the last question time, Mr Speaker, um, I have not had a recent specific meeting on these issues with the Prison Officers Association, but I meet the Prison Officers Association whenever I am requested to meet them. And I call Mrs Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number eight. Mr. Speaker, the fight against cross-border criminality is principally an operational matter for the two police forces and other law enforcement agencies coordinated through the new cross-jurisdictional joint agency task force. The terms of reference for the task force were agreed at a ministerial trilateral meeting held in Dublin on the 21st of December. A strategic oversight group will be jointly chaired by the Deputy Commissioner Operations of Angara Shikana, 
and the PSNI Assistant Chief Constable Crime Operations. Other members will be senior representatives of other relevant law enforcement agencies. The Joint Chairs have already met twice and the first full task force meeting will be in early March. An operations coordination group will be chaired by Chief Superintendents from PSNI and Angarda Shihona. Membership will comprise senior operational representatives from a wider group of relevant law enforcement agencies to be decided by the group. Ms. Dobson for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answer. I am aware of increases in criminal activity, particularly in Louth and Dundalk, which is leading to a bleed across the border with the A1 dual carriageway and housing estates, including in Banbridge, being becoming particularly vulnerable. What reassurances can the Minister give that the PSNI, particularly in Banbridge, have the adequate resources to effectively address this issue and bring those responsible to justice? Well, Mr. Speaker, I can only give a guarantee that the PSNI is provided with the resources which are available for me to provide to the PSNI. Members will be aware that the PSNI budget was significantly protected for next year compared to other aspects of the justice system, but the precise allocation of resources across individual districts is a matter for the Chief Constable and not for me. I do, however, note uh, Mrs. Dobson's particular point relating to cross border criminality, and there is no doubt that the recent upsurge. Uh, of drug-related crime in Dublin has perhaps led to a reallocation of resources by Ankara Shikana, which may well have had some effect in border areas. But it's an important issue that we see the, the arrangements continue between the two police services, and I believe the Joint Agency Task Force will enable better coordination between the two of them. I call Mrs. Dolores Kelly. Thank the uh, Minister for his answer, particularly the latter points. Uh, Minister, you will be aware that there are uh, some 88 uh, gangs here in the north uh, in, re in relation to drugs and, of course, the recent gangland violence we saw in Dublin. What reassurance uh, can you give in, in relation to the House uh, uh, and what information can you give around the, the tie-up and whether or not uh, the models of uh, mafia-type violence in Dublin will not spill onto our streets here in the north? Well, I can give the House the assurance that on the information I receive that there is very close coordination between the two police services, that there is very good work being done, particularly with the new structure of the Joint Agency Task Force, to tackle criminal activity. Um, when Mrs Kelly referred to the number of gangs dealing in drugs, we should also be aware, of course, that many of them are dealing in a variety of different crimes. Uh, that's why it was a particular pleasure for me to see last week the very good work being done by HMRC in terms of tackling diesel fraud which showed that the new marker was extremely effective uh, in catching vehicles which were using laundered diesel. And indeed, we now have clear evidence that even in cases where the old marker has been laundered out, the new marker shows and shows quite clearly. Uh, the good news of that is it means that we are likely to see a reduction in diesel laundering with all the effects on public health and pollution that are associated with it that her colleague, the, uh, the Environment Minister, will be well aware of. The bad news is that that probably means that some of those gangs will be turning to other issues, and we need to ensure that the police response is adequate on both sides of the border to deal with that. Mr. Ali Gadwood. Question number 12. Mr. Speaker, I'm aware of previous criticism of the Ministry of Defence regarding disclosure of material and making former soldiers available for interview for a number of legacy inquests in Northern Ireland. I'm also aware of the impact that these issues can have on the ability to progress legacy inquests and on public confidence. I wrote to the Secretary of State on the 15th of June 2015 asking her to raise the issue of tracing retired military witnesses directly with the Secretary of State for Defence. I asked that he consider what steps might be taken or additional resources be deployed by the MOD to address the problem that the coroners have encountered in respect of retired military witnesses. In response, the Secretary of State for Defence advised that he is conscious of the importance of securing the full participation of the widest possible range of witnesses and that the MOD would do all it reasonably can to facilitate their engagement. I appreciate this response, however it is clear that much more work is required in the identification and tracing of retired military witnesses and communication with them regarding participation in the inquest process. I also note the involvement of the MOD in the preliminary hearings on legacy inquests before Lord Justice Weir recently. Those 43 inquests with an MOD involvement represent a significant proportion of the legacy inquests which remain outstanding. I trust that the MOD will respond fully to the request for information that Lord Justice Weir made in the course of those hearings. 
the ends the period. I'm sorry. That ends the period for uh, listed questions, and we now move on to topical questions. And it comes to Sean Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, um, recently, they, or before Christmas, the, the PSNI Chief Constable and the, and the um, Garda Commissioner welcomed the idea of the border co closer cooperation, the border uh, closer cooperation across the border. The PSNI chief did say that there are policy and legislative concerns that need to be addressed. Could I ask the minister what uh, discussions he has had with his counterpart in Dublin in terms of addressing these concerns? Well, I thank Mr. Rogers for that question, Mr. Speaker. Um, I frequently discuss, I think probably at every available meeting I have with the Irish Justice Minister, I discuss the issues of operational support for the two police services. And I know that there have been discussions ongoing uh, very recently between officials about the issue of the refresh to the cross-border policing strategy, which I am hoping to be able to launch within the next few weeks, um, subject at this stage largely to timing arrangements because of the election for Doyle Aaron. But uh, I do believe that good work has been done around that, but it will be important that we get the public statement of the relaunch of that strategy. Very much. And I call Mr. Chris Hazard. Have he's recovered his breath? Oh, sorry, supplementary. Then gives you a rest. <laughs> Sean. Thanks, thanks, <laughs> th 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 thanks, Mr. Speaker. And um, just following on to that, in terms of a lot of communities have suffered because of cross-border cr crime. No more than the farming community in terms of the loss of livestock and machinery. What has been done, particularly, to address this, this particular area? Well. Mr. Rogers really is now taking me into the, the direct responsibilities of the operational cross-border group. But members will be aware of a very significant amount of work which has been done, in, you know, for example, in support of trailer marking, um, a, a variety of issues relating to farm watch and so on. And I hope that we will be seeing within the next few days further announcement of good work being done. Uh, most of that has been led by individual PCSPs as they look to see what, their, you know, what the local needs are in their area. Uh, but the precise issue of the operational arrangements cross-border do currently rest with the, uh, the two leading police officers, although members will also be aware that a number of other bodies, um, for example, Dard Veterinary Service, have been suggested to be included within the operational subgroup to ensure that we get not just the policing services and the key agencies, but also some agencies which have not always appeared on the criminal justice list involved in ensuring that we tackle uh, the variety of different crime which operates on a cross-border basis. And I call Mr Chris Hazard. Perhaps I could ask the Minister, on the back of his recent statement regarding the courts of state, uh, if his department will now be looking at those courts that do remain uh, and perhaps the remanagement or uh, looking at the best way of services and maybe looking at, and I speak directly of Downpatrick Courthouse, and if there is the potential perhaps to bring additional services to that court. And there I was, Mr. Speaker, thinking that last time I, when I made the court's announcement, Mr. Hazard at least did a good job by not just making a plea for his own local courthouse. Um, the simple answer at this stage. Uh, is that there are no plans to take additional services into Downpatrick at this stage. On the basis of transport and communications links, Downpatrick is seen as serving a fairly discrete area. Um, but it's a bit like the point which I made in response to Mr Ross earlier. No doubt members will suggest all kinds of different uh, projects which might be run in particular courthouses. We need to ensure that we get the balance right and that we manage the costs right. With a lot of the new, uh, the new proposals which are being made around, for example, problem-solving courts uh, being handled in the best way to provide an efficient service. Mr. Hazard for supplement. I thank the Minister for his answer and, and I, I suppose I want to thank that he is given special acknowledgement certainly to the very rural uh, needs of Southdown and the nature of Southdown in particular aspects and that's why the Down Patrick Court exists. Uh, you know, I, I do wish the Health Minister would do likewise. Um, but just on that, perhaps then there's the potential uh, for a refurbishment grant or some sort of resources to be made available to bring Down Patrick Courthouse up to the sort of standard that we would expect from it. Well, Mr. Speaker, members are well aware of the difficult budget situation the DOJ has. Um, I have no doubt the Courts and Tribunal Service is keeping under review all its buildings, but I have not at this stage seen any specific proposals for renovation in Downpatrick, and I suspect the reality of the next financial year or two is it's unlikely there will be anything significant within that timescale. I call Mr. Ian Mulm. 
I could ask the Minister to give us an update on the recruitment of the coroner's investigators uh, post Lither Hall. Thank you. I'm afraid, Mr. Speaker, I can't give any direct additional information on that. Um, safe to say that mem members are aware uh, that the recruitment process is underway, but I'm not sure of the exact detail as to where we are with the recruitment of those particular persons. Thanks, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his short answer uh, to this point. But, uh, Still, you know, could the Minister tell us why the job criteria for the new coroner's investigators uh, was changed from what was sought and recommended by the coroner in the first place? Well, there were specific issues which were looked at regarding the appropriate balance of skills which would be required for the coroner's investigators and also about the issue of the sort of knowledge that the individuals would have of the operation um, of the justice system within Northern Ireland. That is why the criteria sit as they currently sit, and I am satisfied on the evidence that is put to me that it would be possible to recruit people who have the appropriate level of knowledge but who are not in any way compromised in carrying out the work which will be required by the new posts. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, earlier the Minister was uh, answering a question to my colleague Alex Atwood about the need to establish the truth from the past. Uh, I'm sorry that there wasn't time for a supplementary, but perhaps I can use this opportunity to pursue the issue and ask the Minister, in view of the uh, reluctance of the MOD in the British Army uh, to uh, make any attempt uh, to help the disclosures from that terrible past, does he believe it's now the responsibility of the British Prime Minister to take the issue in hand and deal with it? Well, I certainly accept the point which Mr Dalit is making about the historical position, as was seen. Um, I do think uh, that following the letter from the Secretary of State for Defence back to the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland on, on the back of my query, uh, that we have seen uh, an improvement in the, the help which is being offered by the MOD, but that's where I hinted that we need to ensure that it actually is carried through into reality. But we have seen, for example, them instituting better administrative checks on records, you know, including things like pension records, to look at potential witnesses. We have seen uh, the agreement that the Royal Military Police would use their policing powers if necessary and possible to, you know, to assist the process. And look, that would mean, obviously, that the RMP would have policing powers to go into liaison with outside agencies beyond simply trolling through MOD records. So I do think there is some progress implied. The important issue will be to see that the, uh, the comments which were made by Lord Justice Weir are taken into account by the MOD representatives and are carried through in full. Mr. Dallet for supplement. Mr. Speaker, the Minister will be aware that I come from a constituency and a neighbouring one where more than 20 people lost their lives from both communities in rather strange circumstances. Would the Minister agree with me that the time for sending letters here and there and everywhere is over and that the British Government should acknowledge their involvement in that and pay for the cost of finding out and telling the truth about what happened to her loved ones in the past. Well, I agree. Mr Speaker, that the government, as a number of other agencies and as a number of individuals, has a duty to assist in finding the truth about what happened um, in the case of the 55 legacy inquests, which are currently awaiting hearing in courts in Northern Ireland. And that includes a number of people uh, talking about their involvement in these issues, as well as the slightly more bureaucratic approach which we were talking about earlier in terms of uh, finding potential witnesses and making them amenable. So there is a work to be done by agencies and there is an obligation on agencies and individuals, morally an obligation to assist victims. Thank you. And I call Mr Andy Allen. Speaker, can the Minister outline what discussions he's had with the PSNI regarding tackling burglaries in East Belfast? Well, the answer is uh, I have not discussed specifically burglaries in East Belfast with the PSNI because that is very much an operational issue, which is for the Chief Constable. And whilst we discussed 
general issues around policing matters, we do not discuss that level of operational detail. <coughs> Thank the Minister for his answer. And indeed, Minister, I have had a number of constituents throughout the constituency come to me with concerns of a rise in burglaries throughout the constituency. Uh, can I maybe ask the Minister um, if he feels budget constraints will have any impact upon the PSNI's ability to tackle such crime? Well, I thank Mr Allen for the, for the question. Um, the reality is that I have highlighted uh, this and I think every other question time I have done in about the last year. There are budgetary restrictions which are currently being imposed on the PSNI. There are very significant and very severe uh, crimes or threats of crimes which they have to deal with, with the result that there is a certain reprioritisation, and therefore there is probably um, a certain inevitability that there is a slight increase in burglary, particularly as if we look at the statistics, we have seen a very significant decrease in the number of burglaries in Northern Ireland over the last seven or eight years. So in that context, um, much so we might wish it, we cannot expect an ever-decreasing level of crime, and there is no doubt that if there is a reprioritisation because of budget restrictions being imposed on the Department of Justice, then I suspect it is inevitable that there will be some increase. And I call Mr. Robin Newton. Can I ask the, the Minister if he would confirm that those organisations that are involved in the restorative justice aspect of uh, the system do they enjoy his confidence? Mr Speaker, I can only go on the basis that the two key restorative justice organisations are fully accredited and inspected by Criminal Justice Inspection Northern Ireland, along with most statutory uh, elements within the justice system, and the reports I have are favourable of them. Call Mr. Newton for a supplement. Can I ask the Minister, uh, given that they do enjoy his confidence, what plans he has for the development of those organisations to increase their level of competence, professionalism, so that they might indeed be an even better service to the justice system? Well, again, Mr Speaker, given that we are talking about voluntary organisations um, whose direct line of contact is not with the department so much as with the police service, and with some other agencies, indeed with some of the other uh, voluntary sector partners. I am not sure it is the responsibility of the Department to enhance their training, but it is certainly the job of the Department to encourage better joined up working, and I believe we are doing that, to ensure that there is better professionalism amongst all those working in the justice system by encouragement, but not by direction. And I call Mr. Thomas Buchanan. Uh, Mr. Speaker, can I ask the Minister, is he satisfied with the number of prison officers per prisoners in McGabry Prison? Well, clearly, Mr. Speaker, at the present time, uh, there is a reduced number of prison officers. That's why one of the key issues which have been focused on by the Governor and by the senior management team has been around the issue of sickness absence to ensure that officers are at work where possible and a recruitment exercise is being carried out at this stage. But we, um, we need to be careful that we don't automatically assume that the prison supervision ratios which applied some years ago are necessarily appropriate. And to just refer to ratios of one to so many prisoners in particular areas doesn't actually represent the reality of the very different uh, threat levels which exist in different parts of McGabry, the very different kinds of prisoners in different parts of McGabry. And that's why the issue at this stage is to ensure that there are appropriate and not excessive levels of supervision in every area, whilst ensuring that the most difficult areas do receive significantly higher supervision levels. Mr Buchanan, for a very quick... Thank you. Uh, would the Minister then uh, again agree that, due to the lack of prison officers there, that that is the reason for so many being off, on, um, uh, being off if you like, with injury and duty? No, Mr Speaker, I wouldn't agree that that is the position. I think what we've seen um, is a cultural shift in recent months which has seen many more officers on duty and a shift which has ensured that uh, prisoners are being managed better in a way that reduces tension and is less likely to lead to injury to either officers or other prisoners. Thank you very much, Minister. And that ends uh, questions to the Minister for Justice. And we